Are you listening? Damn. And welcome into another episode of the Damn Podcast here on the 24-7 Sports Podcast Network and powered by BeaverBlitz.com. I'm your host, Carter Baines, joined as always by BeaverBlitz.com publisher Angie Machado here on a Tuesday. Little scheduling update for you. Uh, did not record yesterday on a Monday because baseball was wrapping up its opening weekend in Arizona, but we are here to recap Oregon State's opening weekend of the 2023 baseball season. We'll get into that right away and then take a, a little look around the winter sports that are all kind of wrapping up right around now. Uh, late February, early March ends most of those seasons. We're going to go down the line, talk men's and women's basketball, gymnastics, wrestling, track and field, and hit on all of those programs at Oregon State. Some are faring better than others, but most generally doing pretty well this season. Angie, welcome into the show as always here uh on this this Tuesday afternoon in which we're going to talk about a spring sport while we're watching a little bit of snow fall outside. Yeah, uh, it's not. Up. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of weird. It is weird. Um, and I don't know. I know Carter is hoping for snow. I'm kind of, if it's going to do it, let's be, let's snow because I do not want 35 in rain. Um, but I'm actually ready. Spring ball is like two weeks away. So I am ready for some warmth. I do not want to freeze my tail off um, outside, but it is. It's cold. It's snowy. Perfect time to talk winter sports. And a little bit of spring sports. I mean, I'm, yeah, I, I'm yeah. getting ready to bundle up and just absolutely freeze at Goff Stadium this weekend for the home opener. Uh, it's a very early home opener for Oregon State, obviously only playing the one weekend in surprise, coming back and hosting Coppin State this weekend. Uh, forecasts, you know, if, thankfully they're not playing any night games because yeah. it's going to be down into the 20s at night. Uh, we were talking chance of of rain snow mix Sunday and, and or uh, Saturday and Sunday. It's just it's it, that's what happens when you play baseball in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, yeah, this yeah. stuff can happen in March too, but uh, particularly with a home opener in February, that's that's what we're dealing with right now. Well, you know, to be fair, I did happen to look at my phone. I keep Phoenix and Palm Springs kind of on my little weather app, and it's not super nice down there either. This cold front, I guess, is coming and kind of going to take over the whole basically the whole U.S. So although 60 degrees and cloudy in Arizona, it might be a little bit better baseball weather than 30 and uh, chunky rain down in Corvallis. But uh, Carter, I do not envy you this weekend at all. Hey, at least uh, Saturday night for a little basketball will be inside. Yes. Uh, so there could be snow falling outside, but Oregon and Oregon State playing at Gill Coliseum Saturday night at seven. So a, a little two for one going down to Corvallis on Saturday, cover both games. Uh, hard to pass up that opportunity. I'll, I'll, so. I'll, I'll get you local boys for the night. Oh, wonderful. To warm up. Wonderful. That uh, that that sweetens the deal for sure. But yeah, no, you mentioned the, the cooler weather. That's, that's kind of how things started in Surprise. Opening day was uh, around 60 to 62 degrees. It was really windy, but things picked up as the weekend went on, touched, you know, 70, 75, and, and the sun came out. But uh, it, it's always kind of funny to to watch you know the, the first couple of games every now and then surprise uh, it, it does get a little cool by arizona standards so you see everybody in puffy coats and and whatnot and i'm thinking man if it was 65 here i would be outside in a short sleeve t-shirt <laughs> uh you know working out outside like all of these things that i would do if it was even remotely nice in oregon in the winter time um but yeah, that's that's why they do it. That's why yeah. they go down to Arizona every year. I actually have already planned. I have a son. You know, my my oldest son is going down there uh, for college next year. So I already told him. I said he already has talked to my husband Eric about coming down for that um, waste management golf tour event. And I also said then, Luke, if if Oregon State's playing GCU or down in Surprise next year, I think I might need to make a make a little trip down as well. Oh, yeah. No, this would have been a great year to do it because you could have hit the Super Bowl, the Phoenix Open, stay a little longer, go to those games and surprise. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't even want to know how much you'd be paying for tickets. I was going to say, no, I things. wouldn't because <laughs> there's no way I could afford um, Super Bowl tickets. But yes. 
yeah, it would, not it was a, a good time to be in Phoenix. This, this not time. not a bad month for uh, for for yeah. the Phoenix economy this week or uh, the last couple of weeks, month, I guess. Yeah. But uh, anyways, before we get into talking baseball and the winter sports, just want to remind everybody that we do still have a thirty percent off deal at BeaverBullets.com. This is still for new members only, so you can take thirty percent off your first year uh, with an annual subscription that comes out to six dollars and twenty seven cents per month. A great deal if you have not already jumped on the beaver blitz bandwagon we'd love to have you because baseball season and spring football uh, a lot of our stuff does go behind the paywall so uh, we would enjoy for everyone listening right now to be able to read all of our great content Uh, jp's weekly walk off is back oh Uh, my gosh so good too did you read this week's preview season previews are always great jp does a great job yes perfect it was it was fantastic so again that's that's 30 percent off your first year if you are a new member at Beaver Blitz, take advantage while you can. Uh, okay, let's let, let's just dive in. Let, let's, let's talk baseball. Uh, uh, we'll save probably the second half of the show for all of the winter sports, but uh, obviously baseball and softball getting started here in the last two weeks. Oregon State baseball goes three and one at the Sanderson Ford College Baseball Classic at Surprise Stadium. Uh, you know, I, I think they flipped a switch midway through that game on Sunday. I, I think it was a tale of really two and a half games uh you know i i think the first two and a half games for oregon state didn't necessarily go very well even though they won one of them and obviously ended up winning the second um but the sunday and monday games that looked like the oregon state baseball team that you expect to go down to arizona every year so uh just kind of recapping those those four games uh oregon state opens with a loss against new mexico losing seven to two snaps a uh, what I believe was a nine game winning streak against the Lobos and was only the second opening day loss in the last 14 years for the Oregon state baseball program. Obviously some impressive streaks there coming to an end, um, but that's college baseball. It happens. Yeah, it does. Uh, then Oregon state bounces back the following three games an eight, seven win over Minnesota. Minnesota goes zero and four on the weekend. Uh, they come back with a win against New Mexico in game two on Sunday. Uh, and then New Mexico actually finished the weekend at three and one with their lone loss coming uh, in that game on Sunday. And then Oregon State closes things out with an eight inning, 11 nothing win over UC Santa Barbara on Monday. The Gauchos, uh, I believe that puts them at two and two on the weekend. So uh, Oregon State, for the most part, taking care of business, beating on teams that it, it should beat up on. Uh, in, in the second half of the weekend, New Mexico picked to finish last in the Mountain West. UCSB, always, you know, a pretty decent program, but hasn't necessarily been uh, at the caliber uh, that we have seen it in the past over the last couple of years. Minnesota, um, you know, one of those Big Ten teams that that has struggled in the last couple of years after breaking out uh, in that super regional season that sent them to Corvallis. So uh, Oregon State, the best team in surprise and, and looked like it for the second half of the weekend. But Let's let's start with those struggles, Angie, because I know you were following along uh, with the coverage. I had the Flow Sports subscription, so uh, you were kind of at the mercy of the updates that I was providing. It was so good, side. though. It, w- it was so great just to be able to jump in the lodge and, and see what was going on. So um, I appreciate that, Carter. Um, it was it was great. Were you surprised that they lost that first game? I mean, I yeah, like I I would say I was surprised just by the way they lost, lost like. Yeah. Would I have been shocked if Oregon State went three and one or even two and two in surprise? Like probably not. My expectations, I, I think, were a bit tempered entering, you know, the first weekend of the season. You're breaking in so many young players, a lot of newcomers, trying to figure out which lineups work. Um, I didn't expect them to go four and zero, oh, but I certainly didn't expect them to lose seven to two to New Mexico. You know, I thought if they're going to lose, maybe it's to UCSB on Monday. Um, you know, maybe they get tripped up by Minnesota. I figured they would take care of business against New Mexico. Uh, but to see them really just outplayed in, in every facet, out hit 14 to seven, yeah. three errors defensively on opening day. It was, you know, really, it's, it's hard to say uncharacteristic because we don't know what this team is like yet, but uncharacteristic of the Oregon State baseball program to go yeah, because in it felt and, sloppy. and play that poorly. <clears throat> yeah. It felt sloppy. And so, um, but get those out of your, your system early. And, um, you know, I, what, I, I think if there was a, a bright spot, Gavin Turley with his first oh, yeah. at bat being a, a solo home run. I mean, that was, that was pretty uh, exciting, I think. And, and gives Beaver fans some hope for who's going to replace some of those bats that they lost a year ago from a year ago. 
yeah, Turley's home run. If you haven't seen the highlight, go uh, go try to find that on Oregon State's uh, baseball Twitter account. I believe the damn analytics squad measured that at 411 feet off the bat. Okay, exit it, it was crazy. Uh, well above 100 miles per hour. So, I mean, just an absolute rocket off the bat of Turley. Cleared the berm in left field. So, in, in left field at Surprise Stadium, you have to go over the bullpen and then over the you know remaining bit of the berm. And then you get onto the concourse. That ball landed well onto the concourse. Gavin Turley's career starting uh, literally with a bang there. Uh, Angie, let's let's talk about Trent Sellers on the mound. Oregon State's uh, new potential ace who comes in from Lewis and Clark State uh, in in Lewiston, Idaho. Seven strikeouts in three innings, but but not particularly efficient. Yeah, yeah. I I think you know we talked about him last week um, leading up to this and big expectations, big shoes to fill. I, I want to see another outing or two from him just to see if that might've been just some nerves. Um, first, first game of the season. Um, seven strikeouts is, is, isn't anything to, to shake a stick at, but yeah, I expected a little bit better performance from him. Yeah. You know, I, I with those strikeout pitch strikeout pitchers, sometimes efficiency is a bit of a concern because if yeah. you're relying on striking guys out, you know, sometimes they're going to take you deep into counts yeah. and, you know, guys might foul off a few pitches and you see your pitch count climb, but to only get three innings uh, out of your ace, obviously you want a little bit more than that moving forward. I, I think, you know, we'll look at that as kind of a blip on the radar in the long term. Uh, just looking at the stuff that Sellers has, I mean, it's clear that he's going to strike guys out at a pretty high rate. And usually that allows you to go deep into games. Um, but sometimes, you know, you you have games like that where you just get into a lot of full counts. Um, you know, if you walk a guy or two, that can inflate your pitch count as a strikeout, uh, a strikeout pitcher. So um, not entirely like what? What did they not entirely concerning? <clears throat> what was his pitch count? Do you have that? Do you know what they pulled him at? Shoot, did they pull him? I mean, was it because? I mean, do you yeah, think yeah, he they... was above he was above eighty pitches in the okay. third. I remember that. Okay, so that is high, but um, you know, usually a lot of times the coaches too will be a little easier on them early in the season and kind of let them ease into things too. Yeah, which I think, you know, if we move forward a, a little bit here to game three, I, I, I want to dive deeper yeah, into each yeah. of these games. But to your point, I mean, Jaron Hunter was pulled after, I think he went six innings, five, okay. six innings on Sunday and only had 69 pitches. So, you know, like he gave up some runs, guys reached base, but he was very efficient in his work. Didn't even need 70 pitches to get six innings of work. You you very easily could have thrown him out there for, for seven or eight. Yeah, yeah. But that's a case where early in the season, you're just kind of yeah. limiting a guy and saying, hey, we're going to build you up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's go back to game one because yeah. more on the pitching. I think entering the year that we had some we had some concerns about Oregon State's bullpen without Ben Ferrer, who's obviously out with mononucleosis. Uh, Mitch Canham told us that before the season started. Still no timeline on his return. We hope to get a little bit more information this weekend, potentially, because I know he was going back in for uh, another test as soon as they got back from surprise. But the fact that Oregon State puts in five different pitchers, or they use six relievers in this game, five of them were tagged with at least run, with at least, excuse me, with at least one run. So you have five pitchers giving up one run, uh, one of them giving up two, that's just struggles across the yeah, board. I yeah, mean, you don't have one the guy there who's coming in and, and giving you anything in, in the way of, you know, consistent strike. Yeah. And that's, and that's going to have to be, like I said, this is so early. I mean, I feel horrible saying this, but I mean, that's going to be stuff that needs to be figured out as the season progresses and, and guys need to settle down. I mean, again, first game, they have to have a little bit of the first game jitters and, and just kind of, but facing that adversity and how they bounce back from that adversity is, is going to be telling throughout the season. Cause they are a young team. And we've talked about that, that this expectations maybe aren't quite as high, but when you're at Oregon state expectations are exponentially higher than they are at most programs, just because there is this expectation of, of making postseason play. A lot of those struggles carried over into game two, yeah. Oregon state actually had an eight to two lead in this game against Minnesota. It looked like, you know, the Beavers were going to kind of cruise to a bounce back victory. But again, you see costly errors by the defense pitching, just not quite what you expect it to be uh, from an Oregon state staff. Um, the errors you know. are what really stood out to me, Carter, yeah. because that's um, pitching, you know, it can sometimes can take a, a while for guys to kind of settle into a group, but you don't expect to see the errors that we saw this weekend um, 
from a, a team like the Beavers. Yeah, six errors on the weekend. Five of them come in the first two games. Uh, but again, you know, even with the Beavers scoring eight runs against Minnesota, they only, I mean, that was only on five hits. Mostly they were just kind of taking advantage of um, of some shaky pitching from the Golden Gophers. Eight runs on five hits and out hit 13 to five. That's why you yeah. see Minnesota coming back late in the game. They just had more offense uh, as, as far as hitting production goes. Obviously, Oregon State, you know, taking advantage of what was given to them. You, you know, you, you can't fault them there. But um, uh, again, to give up five runs in the seventh, you nearly blow an eight two lead. I think that was, again, telling of some of the concerns we had about the yeah. bullpen. Um, and it wasn't until Sunday and Monday that we saw guys step up. But uh, I mean, they worked. They worked quite a few arms into uh, in, into the action there. I think I said five relievers on Saturday, and yes. I want to say they put in three on Saturday. So, I mean, we saw quite a few guys come in, and and really it was until Ryan Brown came in and and shut things down in the final two innings. Um, you know, there was just nothing in the way of consistency before then. But then you bring in your former freshman All-American closer. He comes in, gives you two clean innings, records his first of what should be many saves on the year, and you pull out uh, an 8-7 win. Uh, Angie, at that point, were you feeling a little better, or were those struggles, again, just kind of like, you know, did they linger and make you think, all right, well, what is this weekend going to turn into? Because that's kind of where I was at that yeah, point. Yeah, baseball's a funny, funny game. Um, and while the opponents this weekend were not anything – I, I hope that the team uses this. And I, I think what we saw, like you said, the flip, the, the switch flipping, I, I hope what that we saw is that the team really realizing that they can't just rely on the fact that they're Oregon state and maybe they have better athletes that it's still a game. And there's still a lot of good athletes, even on these teams that are picked to finish last in the mountain West or um, lower tier big 10, um, because the competition is just going to get tougher and tougher as, as they go into the pac 12. So um, I'm not, I'm not hitting panic button yet. Some of the lodge were, it was a little, a little dicey there for a while, but that's college um, baseball fans. Yes. It's college. I mean, it, like I said, it's baseball. It's a funny game. Um, and I don't, I don't know, Carter totally kind of veering off here, but if you're watching on Netflix, the golf show full swing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. golf and baseball, I mean, while they're completely different sports, very similar, especially for pitching because pitching is such an individual thing that sometimes guys just, guys talking about they're just not feeling it or they kind of get out of their groove. And so it's a matter of kind of hitting your stride at the right time. Hopefully that's, you know, into, into Pac-12 play for Oregon State, um, you know, having the bats wake up at the right time. Lot, lots of little pieces there. But, um, yeah, I, the, the pitching is concerning to me because you would hope after fall ball, after all the practice they've gone through, that you would have some guys in the in the bullpen that you could, you know, kind of rely upon to be consistent. I think they, I, you know, I, I think they did kind of identify one of those guys in game three. So let's use that yes. as uh, kind of a springboard here into that rematch against New Mexico, where one of the stories for me was AJ Hutchison coming in late in that game after Jaron Hunter left, uh, gave up a couple of runs. Hutchison inherited runners for the second game in a row, did not allow a single run across four and two thirds on the weekend, uh, only allowed one base runner of his own, and that was on a hit by pitch. So four and two thirds, no hits no walks and didn't allow any of his inherited runners to score as a true freshman, really impressive performance uh, for a guy who was making his collegiate debut, especially within the context of really everybody else in the bullpen struggling. So I thought yes. he was one of the standouts of the weekend. Yeah. And I actually think that's kind of when everything kind of flipped for the beefs. Um, totally. You know, it, it was kind of like everything they were doing on the, on the mound was just, they were struggling the first two games of the, of the season. And then, when that happened, when AJ Hutchison came in, um, and really didn't blink, he he acted like a veteran, like he had been there before, um, and really kind of got out of some trouble. That actually helps your whole team. It helps everybody relax a little bit. Like, okay, they don't tighten up because okay, our pitching struggling today, so now we need to really. They played tight, I guess, those first couple games, and so seeing them relax, Hutchinson is going to be a fun one to watch. I, I'm excited to see him kind of develop um, because he kind of has a little swagger to him. Yeah. That delivery. He's, he's kind of a, he's not like fully a submariner, but he's got a little sidearm approach, but sometimes he'll go over the top. It's uh, not necessarily like a Cooper jerpy, like funky delivery. It's yeah. one of those just like really unpredictable and, and interesting looking deliveries that I think 
is probably partially the fact I, I think it was partially a factor in why he pitched so well yeah. is you know this is obviously guys first look at him there there was no film on him they didn't really know what to expect uh, and that delivery can definitely throw you off as a hitter but before he took the mound Oregon State got down for nothing against New Mexico things looked bleak it looked like they could be trending towards a second loss to the Lobos another underwhelming performance to start the weekend but it was in the bottom of the fifth where I think things just completely flipped uh, Oregon State from that point forward looked like the team that I, I think many fans expected. Yeah. Uh, Oregon State puts together a five run six. Or they score in the fifth, uh, one run in the fifth, then they score five in the sixth, seven in the eighth. Uh, they score in each of the final four at bats uh, to go ahead and win that one. Uh, 14 to six was the final 15 hits on the day. That was more than the first two games combined. So obviously you saw the offense really wake up. And then that carried into game four. But uh, Angie, let's talk about Garrett Forrester and Travis Bazana, because I think they really sparked this thing. Uh, Both of them, three hits apiece against New Mexico on Sunday. Micah McDowell also had three hits in the leadoff spot. Uh, He was a bright spot on the weekend and and somebody I want to highlight in just a minute. But uh, with Forrester and Bazana in particular, really nothing in the way of production in the first two games from those from those guys but to get that kind of production to get six hits combined from them when you need it the most when you need to pick up some momentum um, I thought they heated up at the right time yeah absolutely and that was I think probably one of the bigger surprises aside from pitching struggles those first two games was kind of how quiet Forrester and Bazana were early you know the start of the season because now they are the veterans of, and it sounds kind of funny to say, especially for Bazana, who's a, a sophomore, but um, you know, these guys are the veterans and they're kind of expected to, especially in the, in the batting order, these guys are, are the offense. So um, it was good to see them wake up and it did it, it really between the Hutchison and then their bats really kind of just the spark, you know, was ignited with, with the team. Yeah. Bazana and Forrester then combined for five more hits on Monday when the Beavers beat UCSB, 11 0. Uh, five Beavers had multiple base knocks in that game. Uh, they out hit the Gauchos 16 to 3, outscored them again 11 0. Mm-hmm. Uh, the game ended in the eighth inning as Mason Guerra knocked in a, a two RBI double uh, to invoke a 10 run rule. So, obviously, you know, usually in that, that final game and surprise, they have travel restrictions and whatnot. So, there was a 10 run rule and a four hour limit on that game. Uh, I think that's the kind of game that, you know, you'd rather have that 11 nothing result come in your final game than in your first, I think, in yes. many ways. Because it was indicative of game over game improvement. Um, I, I think you saw, you know, players heat up rather than, okay, they have one great day to start the weekend and then, you know, you go and struggle the rest. I, I think you want to end on that note rather than start on it in some ways. Um, But the pitching, Angie, in that game also was, again, lights out. Obviously, a combined shutout from the Beavers. A.J. Lattery started. He was one of those guys who struggled early in the weekend in relief, but then came on with probably the best start of the weekend for a Beaver pitcher. Four four innings, three hits, no runs, a walk, three strikeouts, and a hit by pitch. Um, But then, Angie, I think the thing that that stood out the most to me as far as pitching goes, uh, maybe even on the whole weekend, was what Ian Lawson did in relief. Yeah, I mean, three perfect innings, um, six Ks. I mean, that's, um, you can't ask for more, especially like you said, after how they started. And I have to go back because I totally agree with what you said. I think ending the the weekend as they did with, instead of starting on a hot streak, I, I actually think it was a good wake up call for them because I think sometimes it's easy to kind of believe your own press and you, you hear, you know, well, we're the Beavers, so we're expected to win this thing. And, you know, we're Oregon State, we're ranked higher. So, kind of to get punched in the mouth early on, especially by teams that you've beaten consistently over the years. The one that you beat 21 to one on opening day the the year before. Yeah, And and you had a nine Oh streak against, Mm -hmm. uh, I I think that's a good wake up call. And it was something that Mitch Canham could use in his favor to kind of get that clubhouse to rally around him and be like, you know, this isn't us. And this is, and then get those veterans. um, Like I said, sometimes you just need to see yourself against competition to either be knocked down a peg or say, okay, we can compete. You know, if you're, if you're one of the lower tier teams, I mean, I'm sure on that same note, New Mexico, after knocking off the beeves, the way they did that game one is kind of like feeling pretty good about themselves. So no, I, I thought Ian Lawson then and, and Lattery both to come back um, after the struggles they had early. I, 
I, I think there's so much bright, uh, bright spots that the Beavers can take from this as they head into kind of the early, I mean, well, the early part of the season. Yeah, to that point about, you know, maybe getting a wake up call, I think also sometimes too, we overlook the fact that in baseball, some days you like, you just frankly don't have it. You don't have it. And it's very possible that, you know, day one, like that could be the worst game Oregon State plays all year. And it could just be because nobody was on their A game. They bounce back the next couple of days where you've got these individual performances that you see shine. Like some days that's just not going to happen. Travis Bazan is not going to hit three. <laughs> he's not going to have three hits a game the rest of the way. You know, like there are going to be games where he does not get on base. That's going to happen. Yeah. Um, it's just, it, it is entirely possible again with this small sample size that we'll look back at that game and just say that was that rare game where nothing went right. And that was a blip on the radar. And, and that's why, now, you know, that's why I love that Pac-12, like they play series, yeah. honestly, because there's some games that you get outworked. I mean, are you just don't feel it? it? It just happens. So, I mean, think about, I think about college and tests and high school and tests. And some days, no matter how good, how well I knew material or what, it just wasn't my day. Yeah. Now on the same, you know, on the flip side, it's yeah. entirely possible that those are red flags that yes. need to be addressed and that will raise concerns and, and could be weaknesses the rest of the way that's the beauty of opening weekend is we don't know. So it gives us all these things to talk about. Talk about. Yes. <laughs> but I uh, think, I think if you're a beaver, I mean, I think for beaver fans, it's, there's a lot to be excited about. I mean, it, again, it's a young team. If this was a veteran team that, that had this weekend, I think maybe you have a little more concern, but I think a young team, and there's just too many unknowns in this small sa sample size. There still is this great hope for, you know, how will they, how will they react? With it being such a young team, we saw 11 newcomers make their Oregon State debuts over the weekend. A couple of guys who had, who had been around as well, who didn't necessarily play a whole lot in their careers, also um, made their debuts in earnest. But let's focus on just some of those newcomers uh, proper who shined this weekend. Adrian Hutchison, we talked about him, could be one of the team's best relievers as a freshman if he keeps this up. Uh, he's somebody who was extremely highly touted by some of the hitters who faced him in practice, uh, Mitch Canham as well, kind of pointing to him as somebody who was going to make an impact as a freshman. And there's there's Duke. Duke making his his appearance. Yes. Um, something. But staying, staying on the mound, Trent Sellers obviously has the stuff to be an ace. We saw that with the strikeout numbers, just needs to be more efficient. <clears throat> uh, Gavin Turley obviously flashed his tools as well. Uh, not only the power that we saw with that home run, but the the presence he has out in right field. I mean, there were times where, uh, you know, he would catch a fly ball. You'd think, all right, this is a tag up opportunity, but the teams wouldn't send the runner knowing that Gavin Turley has a rocket of an arm. Uh, some of the plays he made out there in, in protecting runs from scoring were impressive. I'm excited to see him in person, and I think he's going to shine as the season goes on as one of the uh, the next in, in a very long line of true freshmen to come in and contribute right away. Uh, let's stay in the outfield with Ruben Cedillo, who Angie, uh, we spoke with uh, in the week leading up to game day. And, you know, we got a, a pretty good idea that he would be in the opening day lineup, but I don't know if I expected six of 15, you know, batting in the top third of the order, looking like one of the top offensive weapons on this team right away. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't expect that at all. I, you know, I, I'd heard some great things from the coaching staff and from players and kind of leading up to this week, but I didn't expect him to be in the top third of the, of the order. He did have an error in game one that uh, was just one of those where, frankly, you just have to make the play. Ball landed in his glove in center field and just and popped out. But other than that, it was a, a pretty pristine weekend for Ruben Cedillo in center field. Uh, and then one last guy I wanted to highlight was Mikey Kane, who I think has everyday third base potential right away. Uh, again, another freshman who, um, you know, some of these guys we, we talk up and, and highlight a little bit more in the preseason. Gavin Turley, obviously, for for good reason. Last year, Travis Bazana for good reason. Mikey Kane, I think, flew under the radar a little bit as a newcomer, uh, but steps in right away, starts all four games. Uh, and again, I think what he did defensively, but then also offensively uh, with, with quite a few hits on that side as well. He's showing what we what we hoped one of the guys in that third base rotation last year would show. You know, Jake Ducart, you know, would have these stretches where he's playing well and then just commit errors after errors. And Mason Guerrero would come in and and you know hit the hit hit the baseball out of its seams and then couldn't do anything defensively. Mikey Kane did both of those things. 
you know, he, he brought it on both sides of the ball in his first weekend of action. And then Guerra came in also and, and uh, actually now leads the team in hitting. I think he was three for three on the weekend um, as, as a sub, but I, I think we're looking at third base right now with a little bit more optimism than we did um, at the end of last year or even before the season started. Yeah. I mean, last week, that was our big question mark heading, you know, was, was third, but who would be, you know, kind of the, the go-to person at, at third base. A couple other standouts, again, guys that I mentioned who are potentially popping late in their career. Uh, Micah McDowell and Brady Casper just had unbelievable weekends. Casper at, at DH, Micah McDowell starting in left field in the final, I believe, three games of the weekend. Combined to go 11 of 27, eight RBI, six walks, and two doubles. Uh, six of those eight RBI coming from Casper alone. Again, these are two guys, particularly with McDowell, who, who have been here for years maybe haven't been part of the the rotation in the outfield, but are starting to get opportunities. And I, I think it speaks to the player development at Oregon state, which is obviously a key reason why Oregon state has become a premier program in the country, you know, making the most of the talent it gets uh, particularly, you know, in the early years of the Pat Casey dynasty, um, not recruiting at a particularly high level, but finding guys that you can develop and year over year get improvement from, uh, Micah McDowell and Brady Casper might be the next two in that line of guys who just pop really late in their career because they've been in the system for so long. Oh, Angie's on mute right now. Sorry, I muted myself because the dog was still barking, but breaking news. Um, schedule change for Friday's game has been moved to 305 first pitch. Just Good hot off the know. presses. Good to know. Go. Um, Sorry. That was that just popped up, so I thought it was pretty timely. Um, but I agree; I, I, it's fun to see these guys with with Casper and McDowell really kind of shining um, late in their their career. Uh, speaking of just random things that are popping, a question from Brian Miller in the YouTube chat: Any word how longer we have to be dealing with Flow Sports? Uh, good news, no more. Flow Sports is is just the the first weekend of of the season, so. Uh, this is your reminder. If you're listening right now, we signed up for the monthly deal. Cancel your subscription Cancel. unless you want to watch other games. You don't need it any more anymore. Uh, um, you don't want them to charge you another 30 bucks in, in March. Go ahead and cancel that. Uh, no more Oregon State baseball games on Flow Sports the rest of the way. Uh, okay, just a couple more points on opening weekend before we move on to the winter sports. A couple of things we need to see moving forward, Angie. Uh, obviously, we've kind of highlighted our concerns from the first four games. The thing for me that I think is going to be the most crucial moving forward outside of the errors, outside of the bullpen, is just you you need better performances from your starters moving forward. Because, you know, outside of Hunter going into the sixth inning, outside of uh, Sellers' seven strikeouts, like nobody really put together a complete performance on the mound in week one. Uh, Jacob Kamatz was, was fine, but like, you know, again, not the most efficient. Yeah. I, I think you just need you need one guy to emerge as an ace. And again, it's so early in the season that there is plenty of time for this to happen. But you need one guy to emerge as an ace, which we still expect sellers to do. You need your Saturday guy to to be a little bit more locked down. And you need your Sunday guy to, to be solid as well. Um, really didn't see a whole lot of that from the rotation. But again, it's I think it's too early to write anybody off in this rotation. Absolutely. But yeah, they were not efficient. And that's, you, you need guys going longer than three or four innings. Um, my, one of my th things that I want to watch is just the bats and they did come alive, but just consistency at the plate um, offensively. So that is something that um, is one of my takeaways is seeing that continue to develop as, as they move forward. Big takeaway for me. Uh, and this doesn't have to do with any particular player or performance or, or what have you. It's, it's just kind of college baseball as a whole. The sample size is so small that we can overreact positively or negatively. I don't think this team is as bad as its opening day loss. I don't think it's as good as its 11-0 win over UCSB. But I also don't think it's as mediocre as you know the middle 18 innings okay. of the weekend i i think this team is is probably closer to what we saw against ucsb okay. um but it's going to have days like the new mexico game that's the important thing to remember here i think i saw you know i, I saw a lot of fans particularly in the lodge at beaver blitz you know the most passionate of fans 
overreacting one way or another. And like, you can do that, but you're going to be exhausted by the time <laughs> June rolls around and, and the postseason is here. Just ride the wave of the college baseball season. There are going to be highs. There are going to be lows. Shoot, Tennessee is the was the second ranked team in the country entering the year, lost two games, and it's still number three because D1 baseball does not overreact to one weekend. So yeah. Stanford lost. Just, I mean, there's a lot of teams that had some pretty ugly losses this week one. I think just keep that perspective to go three and one with a team this young, this early in the season, but to improve day over day. Absolute resounding success, in my opinion. I think this team is going to be just fine. But again, I do want to see how it responds to the higher level of opposition that it will face in the Pac-12. Um, it's going to get tests early in the season, which I think is I think it's good for a young team. Um, but looking ahead to this weekend, Oregon State's home opener, as Angie just said, remind me of the time change. 305 for first pitch for Friday. Okay, 305 on Friday. That's moved up from 535. So, you know, unfortunately, if you're planning on going after work gets off, might not work out but uh if, if you're in corvallis and you're and you're you know you've got the afternoon uh go watch some baseball there the home opener against coppin state friday at 305 they'll return to the diamond saturday and sunday at 135 and 105 respectively uh, i'll be down there for certainly saturday and sunday the, the time change makes friday intriguing but i might uh cover that one from home but uh, we'll have quotes after the the saturday and sunday games uh, so reason to head to beaverblitz.com for more baseball coverage this weekend of Oregon State's home opener. Uh, those will be broadcast on the Oregon State live stream, by the way. So if you go to uh, the Pac-12 Network's website or the Oregon State baseball schedule uh, uh, web page, you can find a link to that. All right. <laughs> I need to catch my breath for a second. That was a lot of baseball talk. Okay. We're going to come back to talk winter sports in just a minute. Uh, Angie, what were you going to... Oh, gonna I was just going to help you out here. And oh, just perfect. For a quick... I'll, just I'll to grab let a you sip know, of water real quick. 30% off the first year um, of Beaver Blitz. Get you a full year at six twenty seven dollars a month. Um, super great deal. If you're not in the lodge, you need to be. We're talking all things baseball, of course. Um but we're also jumping footballs right around the corner. So spring camp starts in two weeks, two weeks from today, actually, we will be down in Corvallis. Is that right, Carter? Is, am I, is it two weeks yes, from today? It is. Um, so two weeks from today, we will be in Corvallis. We're also previewing and talking to some of Oregon State's top 2024 prospects. So um, I have been running those young men down, getting their thoughts on Oregon State, when they're going to be visiting, um, checking things out. And so that is all in the lodge as well. So 30% off first year that will not be hanging on for very much longer. Um, so definitely come check it out. With that, let's move to the winter sports, which are entering the home stretch right now. Uh, for some of them, you know, I think Oregon State fans might be glad to see the season come to an end, uh, particularly with regards to the basketball teams, Oregon State men's basketball. Checking in at 11th in the Pac-12 right now, 10 and 18 overall, 4 and 13 in conference play. The Beavers getting ready to host Oregon uh, for the rematch in the rivalry series on Saturday at seven. Then they will uh, they'll close things out with their second and third straight home games. Uh, this is a kind of a lengthy home stand to to close the season next weekend against the Bay Area schools, and then of course they'll head to Vegas for the Pac-12 tournament. I think Angie at this point. The team's just looking to finish strong, find something that it can take into the off season. I mean, there's really very little to play for, obviously, at this point. You know, you can hope to run the table in the Pac-12 tournament. I don't think with this team that's on the table like it was in 2020. But um, I don't I don't know. What, what, what would you need to do over the next three regular season games and in the tournament to to remove the bitter taste out of your mouth? if you are the Oregon state men's basketball team right now? Well, I think if you're the men's basketball team, you you need to win out of the next four plus tournament. I'd, I'd love to see him win half, but I, I what what's sad Carter is the fact that I think so many fans have just tuned out. They don't even, mm -hmm. it's, it's just like basketball is done to them. It's baseball now football. Um, so they've lost so many fans over the past few years that were, I mean, after that elite eight run, you had all this excitement and it's just like, totally went off a cliff it's to the point now where it's not even i mean 
we have a thread in the lodge, but it doesn't even get any play. Nobody really cares. It's not like anybody wants to invest time in it. So, you know, Feed Oregon is always is a big one. Bay Area schools, if you could maybe split and then try to, you know, win one or two in Vegas. Um, and then I think it comes down to, I think the actually key off season is keeping this team together because we said coming into the season, how young this team was um, with Pope and Rataj and we've seen, we've seen flashes, but they need to stay together. And Oregon State is going to, you know, this is where Tinkle's going to have to keep these guys together for another year, hopefully to see what they do then in year two in his system and, and build from that. Certainly a sad state of affairs with, I think, just generally the apathy surrounding the program right now. And I, I think that's limited to the fan base. I, I don't think it's crept into the the team and into the locker no, room at all. No. I know you can look at the scores from last weekend on that trip to, you know, up, up to the Washington schools and say, well, you know, they gave up. Well, you know, they've lost those kinds of games and then come back and, and beat teams the following weekend. I mean, look, last weekend they just beat USC. Um, so I, you know, I, I think they're still playing hard. Uh, everything that I have heard suggests that the culture is, is just completely rebuilt. Uh, this team loves being together, which last year was not know, the case. Obviously that is a stark <laughs> contrast from last year. So in that way, this season is somewhat of a success. I mean, Oregon state yeah. has won double digit games. It's rebuilt the culture. It has young pieces that I think people, even through the apathy are excited about watching in the future. So in many ways, I, I think the season can be looked at as somewhat of a success, which feels weird to say, you know, when you're watching this team go out game by game, score 40 to 50 points and, and lose by but double But the defense, I would, I would also say the defense, though, on a, as a bright spot, Oregon State isn't scoring much offensively, and that is the hugest concern. But they're holding teams that can um, – they're holding teams too. So their defense has, has been better. Like you said, though, the culture is what's the change. But now they have to hold these guys together in the yeah. era of transfer portal, um, NIL, keeping these guys together. And and with the track record that Oregon State has as far as keeping guys, I mean, we've talked at length about uh, guys like Warren Washington, who transferred yeah. out of the program and now is, is starting at ASU, or guys like Jared Lucas, who... Uh, you know, is now at Nevada and, you know, one of the best players in the Mountain West, but like Oregon State just has not kept its talent on campus very well the last few years. That's the key. I, I think they're they're in a better position to do that this year, just with everything, again, that I've heard and that I've seen culture wise. Uh, you know, Wayne Tinkle even said before the USC game, like he felt like guys were kind of goofing off, joking around during shoot around and, and he was kind of upset. But then they go out and win like yeah. that's that's a sign of a, a good culture where you can have a shoot around like that and it's actually productive in yeah, some ways. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, that helps keep guys on campus. It sounds like Jordan Pope is completely bought into staying. At least that's, you know, what that's kind of the vibe that has been put out there. Uh, obviously keeping him around is, is the key to having any sort of success yeah. next year. But um, again, yeah, I, I think there are enough pieces there. They have found at least some success winning 10 games, um, and they've rebuilt the culture. If, if we talked about expectations at the beginning of the season, I, I don't know that I'd say they've like outdone them, but I think they've certainly met or, you know, maybe slightly outdone expectations, which is really all you can ask. Yeah. I mean, cause when we, when we pre preseason, I mean, last year was so abysmal. It, it didn't, the, the bottom it felt was so low. So yeah, double digit wins, winning four pack 12 games. I mean, obviously you'd like to, at least be 500, I think, but um, no, I think, I think they, I mean, we knew it was going to be a rebuilding year. So it's, yeah. it's one of those things now that now they have to take that next step. And that's yeah. where next year, I think, I think not only for this team and the program, but for Wayne Tinkle in his career at Oregon state, that's going to be the, you know, I know people are wanting to see him gone this year, but I think you need to give him next year, give him that chance to rebuild this thing after how horrible last year was um, and see how much they can improve next year. Yeah, look, I mean, this this season has been bad. There's there's no there's no way around it. Um, but there have been enough bright spots and enough kind of visible building yeah. blocks that you can point to where you go into next year saying, you know, this is this is our chance. This is Wayne Tinkle's chance to prove that he can build this program back up. If he can't do it next year, that's probably yeah. it. You probably blow it up and you know you move on. 
but, but last year, to a point now where there is a little bit of reason to be optimistic yeah, about next yeah. year, which of course this time last year, you know, we said oh. this program's going into the dumpster. But last year felt like almost Gary Anderson esque yeah. for the yeah. the state of the the program, the culture. I mean, when yeah. you had guys basically not listening to the coaches, blowing them off as they walk by him on the, uh, it was horrible, horrible. Yeah. So I, I guess the point there being. Yeah, the season has been extremely painful, but let's check back next year. If if Oregon State has another year like this, you know, then we're you know then serious changes and, and discussions will be had. Um, but I think there's a there's been enough improvements in key areas that you can say, okay, you know, let's let's give it one more year and see what yeah. happens. Uh, moving to the women's side again. <laughs> A really disappointing year, I think, in a very different way, though. Um, almost an identical record to the men's team. Uh, they're at 11 and 16 overall and 3 and 13 in Pac 12 play. They've lost eight in a row. Uh, but it's a team that's lost very few blowouts and, and really is just not getting over the hump and losing a bunch of five, seven, two, three point games. Mm-hmm. Um, and that can get infuriating. That can, I mean, that can wear on you and, and that can kind of compound a little bit. Um, it it is it is really odd to see Oregon State, Oregon, Washington ranking at the bottom of the Pac-12, but that's just kind of where we're at as a women's basketball conference in the Pac-12, where everyone has gotten so much better over the last five years that your traditional powers, like an Oregon State or an Oregon, you know, so, sometimes teams are just going to have to. By nature of everybody else getting better, some teams are going to fall backwards, and that's what we've seen from some of these programs. Yeah, and that's just that's the nature of being in a one of the top conferences in the sport. I mean, you, I mean, just even men's basketball is pretty strong, but that's you know just like baseball. Again, baseball is when you look or softball when you look at schools that are, you know, you have six schools in the top twenty-five, and I mean that's that's just you're right. It's they're going to have some take some steps back. Um, I, I loved it. There was a, an article I saw online about. Um, is Scott Ruick. I mean, is, should Oregon State make, like, are you crazy? I, I, this guy is like one, it, it's funny. Fans are funny. Media is funny. So um, he'll get it back. And, and there's some talent on the team. Like you said, nobody's getting, it's not like they're getting blown out. So um, sometimes you just got to come together more and, and next year could be another big year for them. Yeah, I think Scott Ruick has earned the benefit of the doubt considering uh, they haven't had a season like this in literally an entire decade. Yeah, Uh, yeah. Scott Ruick has had so many great tournament runs. Like, I think you give him one down year. I mean, and like you said, it's not just Oregon State having a down year. It's it's the buildup then of the rest of the conference. And so when you you tell me that Oregon, Oregon State, and Washington are all three down on the bottom of the Pac-12, and those are three traditionally very strong programs, it just means the rest of your conference is, is playing and, and recruiting at a way higher level. Yeah. If, if you want tangible points to, to look at and say, okay, here's a reason to be excited about next year. Uh, Reagan beers, probably PAC 12 freshman of the year. Yeah. Uh, at least, at least a top candidate for it. Uh, Tamia Gardner has been very good since, uh, since she made her debut about midway through the season. You know, it's Oregon State has recruited at a level that has been almost unmatched by any other program in women's college basketball. Oregon's right up there. Stanford's right up there. But I mean, there are very few programs that have recruited the amount of five stars, McDonald's, All-Americans that Oregon State has. And when you add all of those on top of each other, you're going to find players like a Reagan Beers, like a Tamia Gardner. And that's going to allow you to rebuild when you have when you have pieces like that. I mean, you know, it, it's hard to compare across sports, but like there are football programs that can have down years, but recruit four and five stars and boom, next year they're right That's back true. at yeah. it. You know, I don't think any, anyone would be shocked to see Alabama win 12 games next year because they have more talent than anybody else. I, I'm not comparing Oregon State women's, women's basketball to Alabama football, <laughs> but it just goes to show when you have the talent, yeah. you know, if it's young, give it a year and see what happens. Um, again, you know, like the men's basketball program, retaining some of that talent has become more of a concern over the last few seasons, but, um, the pieces are there for, for Scott Ruick to get Oregon state's mojo back next year. Absolutely. And I think you can be more optimistic about the women's basketball team getting back to elite status than you can about 
even men's basketball getting back to just being average or slightly above average. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, yeah, again, a, a down year, but one that I don't think should come with a ton of concern for the long term. Now, if it happens two years in a row, yeah, sure, let's yeah. evaluate. But um, I would fully expect to see Oregon State women's basketball rejoin the the competitive side of the Pac-12 next year. All right, ten more minutes, so let's uh, let's touch on these three more sports, and then we'll play name that be even get out of here. Perfect. Uh, the next one, of, I'm of excited course, about gymnastics. Yeah, I mean, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about Jade Carey for the next 10 minutes, but unfortunately we can't. So let's just highlight what the gymnastics program is doing right now. 9-3-2 and two overall, 2-0-2 two, oh, and two in Pac-12. That's, of course, winless. There's two ties in there against highly ranked programs. And that's another another co- where the conference is just strong top to bottom. I yeah. mean, Pac-12 is one of the best gymnastics conferences in the country. Oregon State ranking number 11 nationally as a team, uh, as, as a team number four on the balance beam and number six on the floor. Individual rankings, of course, Jade Carey, you know, leading the Pac-12, leading the, the nation in some of these events. Uh, she's tied for first nationally in the all around. She's top 10 in all four events and number one in the nation on the vault. Uh, she actually picked up her fifth Pac-12 gymnast of the week today after earning two perfect tens against Arizona on Saturday. So um, again, just, I mean, elite performance yeah. from the Oregon State Gymnastics Program. That's what you've come to expect, even before Jade Carey got here. I mean, this but is a, a top 20 program. Yeah. She in Corvallis. Yeah. And, and gymnastics is an interesting one. And, and it's one that I, it, it kind of drives me crazy sometimes too, because it is subjective in the, in the way that it, it scored. Um, sometimes it feels like, you know, the, the teams that are supposed to win kind of, you know, the Utahs, the UCLA's kind of get the nod, but um, just exciting. I remember going to a, a gymnastics meet as in a, as a college kid and I wasn't real thrilled. I was kind of like, okay. Um, but now I love watching them on TV and that Utah match, uh, Utah mm-hmm. is coming to town on March 11th. Um, Gil will be electric for that. So um, I think they're sold out except for some GA tickets. Yes. Um, you know, I mean, I always say try to get to stuff if you can, but that right there, that weekend will be crazy if you can make it because that will be a lot of fun against one of the top, well, two of the top two programs in the country going at it right before Pac-12 championship. Yeah, this program's really hitting its stride right now, too, as the season kind of nears its finish. Uh, the team actually recorded a, a 49.625 mark on the beam over Arizona, setting a program record. Um, so obviously, you know, it's, it's not just Jade Carey getting yeah. the job done. She might be the one who's, you know, earning the, the awards and ranking at the top of the nation, but this is a deep program. Um, you know, people like Matty Dagan who have been here in Corvallis for so long and continuing to perform at a high level, just helping, um, kind of that program prove that is, that it is top to bottom, one of the best yeah. in the country. Uh, Oregon state goes to Stanford on Friday. Uh, they'll travel to Tempe to take on Arizona State on March 4th. And then, like Angie mentioned, that next home meet is is the final meet of the regular season on March 11th against Utah. Uh, reserved seating sold out a month in advance, but you can still get general admission tickets if you want to go see Jade Carey at Oregon State one more time this season. Uh, okay, moving to wrestling now. Uh, we're going to have to cruise through these next yeah. two. I, and wrestling. I don't, I'm going to be honest. I don't know anything really about wrestling. So yeah. So I, I was, I was going to preface <laughs> these next two sports to be completely honest. We don't really cover that much at, at, at Beaver Blitz. I, I don't follow personally, um, but wrestling program seven and seven overall two and two in the pac 12, just a few spots outside of the top 25. Again, a very strong wrestling conference out here in the pac 12. Uh, the Beavers will close their regular season on Sunday when they host Stanford, uh, quite a few individuals ranked nationally. Uh, Trey Munoz is 21 and three Tanner Harvey, 20 and five Matthew Olguin, uh, 19 and five on the year. Uh, so again, Oregon state with quite a few high end individual performances. This is a program that's coming off a year in which Chris Pendleton won the PAC 12 coach of the year, uh, produced four all Americans last year. That's the program's most since 1995. Uh, clearly Chris Pendleton, Chris Pendleton has this program back on the right track very early in his coaching tenure. And then to uh, women's indoor track and field, the last winter sport we're going to highlight here. Uh, This is a program, Angie, that was actually ranked for the first time in program history 
on January 30th, uh, which checked in at number 21 nationally. It's fallen to 52nd in the national rankings. Um, but again, a, a sport that is on the rise. We're seeing high-end individual performances from uh, multiple athletes here. Kaylee Mitchell and Grace Featherstone continue to break school records. We have quite a few athletes vying for national championship appearances and those NCAA championships, again, on the indoor side of the track and field are set for March 10th and March 11th. There are two more meets that Oregon State will attend before then. So uh, again, something to keep an eye on. Uh, early March, you will see Oregon State athletes competing uh, in the national championships for the second year in a row. Okay, that concludes our wraparound of the winter sports. We'll try to, to hit on those as they come to a conclusion in the middle of March, but uh, just an update there on where they stand. Uh, about a week or two ahead of the postseason for most sports. Let's play Name That Beef. Okay. We got another round coming up. We're going to close out with this game that we introduced two weeks ago. Uh, Angie Angie took round one. I, I got to hand it to her. I, I lost. She beat me. Um, she she got, uh, oh, shoot. Who, who did I quiz you on? Um. Dang, now I can't even remember. But it was, it was Storm Woods. Storm Woods, thank you. Like so I'm you got Storm Woods in 11 her. guesses. I think it took me 12 or 13 12. to get Stephen Paya. Yeah. Yeah, so you just barely uh, barely got the edge there. You lead the series 1-0. And uh, I'm, I'm going to try to bounce back here. But it is your turn to guess. Okay. Again, um, yes or no questions. Yes or no. We're going to tally how many you ask. And uh, you're going to try to guess an Oregon State football player who has been on the roster, maybe maybe currently, maybe not, since 2000. And let's get it started. Okay. Is this player, does this player play off, or did, is this player currently on the roster? No. Okay. Um, did this player play offense? Yes. Okay. Did this player, has this player played since 2010? No. Is this player a quarterback? No. Are you keeping track of my guesses? Yeah, yeah, I got you. That's this number player, four. Okay. Does this play? Does this player uh, play running back? No. Is this player a wide receiver? Yes. We've narrowed down the position here. Narrow down the position, and we know it's a 2000 to 2010 Oregon State football player. Um, did this player play between 2000 and 05? No. Is this player James Rogers? No. <laughs> Did this player play in the NFL? Yes. Is this player Marcus Wheaton? No. Damn. Marcus Wheaton would have been uh, would have been within the last ten years. Oh. Hmm. Okay. Um. Don't look in the chat, but the correct answer is there. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. NFL. It's not James. Um, bu -bu 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 -bum. Okay, if you are really stuck, there is a hint in there. If you need it. Okay, I'm not gonna. No, I don't want to look. I don't want to look. I don't want to look. Um, this is a wide receiver who played from 2005, 2005 to 2010. 2010. I'm just. I'm trying to think of years because there's a there's a nice chunk there, like in the right. like in the eight to twelve. And I'm trying to remember. Long line of great wide receivers at Oregon State around that time. Did this player win? Oh, never mind. Never mind. Because if they played in the NFL, they would have won. Like, um, I think wide receivers. Is this wide receiver Sammy? It is Sammy Strong. <laughs> <laughs> Two, three, four, five, six, seven. 9, 10, 11 guesses. Well, you're consistent. So that's two weeks in a row. It took you 11 guesses. Okay. Sammy Strato, that's a great guess. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I did take 11. Huh. I, just, yeah. I thought I did it way quicker. Okay. 
11. I'll give you credit though, because that would have beaten me last week again. So I know. Well, no, because I was it, it. I got really like. So I was thinking of all these great wide receivers in that. Right, but like I said, then some of them I couldn't remember if they were there like 2012. If they were, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, because Marcus little... Wheaton would have finished up uh, what 2011. Yeah, I think. Yeah, and then like Mulaney. I mean, there's been a yeah. bunch of guys that I was thinking of. But anyway, okay, yay. There you have it. I will try to beat 11 next week. That's going to be tough considering nobody through three rounds has gotten better than that. So um, we will see if I have it in myself to to do that next week. How nice. Anything you, you want to. Am I, no, I going to be nice to you or am I going to try to stump you? You're going to pull an offensive lineman from 2004. <laughs> <laughs> there were some good ones. There were some good ones. Hey, the. I, I, I went, like you said, you went to like the yep. all-conference, all-American yep, list. That's what I went I, to yeah, the all-American kinda... list. Sammy Strader was an all-American punt returner okay. in 2000. Oh, shoot. I lost the year. I, I want to okay. say 08. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Oh, your again, dad, was... actually. Your dad is like nails on this game. I know. He's beating your... both of us. I know. You're... We should bring your dad on like more like to be a guest. Yes, because he's like his nails. Wealth of knowledge. Yes, he is. All right, AG, anything you want to add? Any more breaking news? Uh, we not have, that it's again, popped that, up. Yeah, no, that nothing. baseball game baseball game on Friday being moved up to, to 305 did, uh, that did pop during the episode. But if you've got nothing else, let's go ahead and get out of here. Let's do it. All right, we're going to come back next Monday. Again, we're on a Tuesday this week just because of the wonky baseball schedule playing on a Monday. We will be back next Monday. Until then, you can follow her on Twitter, at Angie Machado, you can follow me at Carter Baines, and we will talk to you next week for another episode of the Damn Podcast. Mm-hmm.